the, the cartel bullion banks have been holding back the price of silver for, for a very long time. In fact, four or five commercial banks holding the largest concentrated short position in any commodity traded on COMEX. It's in silver. But as the price has been rising, the losses on these commercial banks' balance sheet has to be extraordinary and borderline unbearable at some point. In the West, finds that they've got a problem. I mean, they've, they're, they're too used to uh, running the market up and down uh, to generate enormous trading profits um, and uh, quite happily run uh, fairly large short positions in the process. But now they can't cover their positions. And we're seeing this very dramatically in the price of silver, more so than in gold, where there is actually greater liquidity. The banks, the swap dealing banks, uh, they're currently net short about 40,000 contracts. What, 5,000 ounces a contract, that's $200 million. And you're like, well, wait a second, every dollar that the price goes up, then that's $200 million in losses. So you think, okay, well, they've got an incentive to keep price in check, but the problem if they keep price, their price, the New York price in check, and the Shanghai price keeps going like this, um, well, now that ar an arbitrage opportunity develops, and all of a sudden the silver that is backing the exchanges, you know, and all their derivatives and the leverage in there, all of a sudden they risk losing. In today's episode, three financial experts, Andy Sheckman, Alastair McLeod, and Craig Hemke, talk about the recent price volatility in gold and silver markets. The precious metals are in a bull trend, but after a massive breakout to $32, silver went back down to $30. We watched hours of content to bring you the best clips of the week so you don't have to. We'll also bring you the markets recap later in the episode. Now, smash the subscribe button, hit the like button, and turn on notifications. Enjoy the episode. I think especially silver. And when you look at the COMEX numbers and, and you can see that these bullion banks, the, the cartel bullion banks, have been holding back the price of silver for, for a very long time. In fact, four or five commercial banks holding the largest concentrated short position in any commodity traded on COMEX. It's in silver. But as the price has been rising, the losses on these commercial banks' balance sheet has to be extraordinary and borderline unbearable at some point. And they're going to be forced to cover the paper shorts. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, we've always just taken for granted. People will say, well, they can just keep doing this forever. Uh, you can in an environment where the demand for those commodities is non-existent, but you can only manipulate a market over an extended period of time by pushing it in the direction that it is truly going. And the trust in the United States and the Western system has been extraordinary for a very long time, but it's as if the glass has been broken and putting back that glass is akin to putting back the trust that has been shattered at least across the entire Southern hemisphere, if not most of the globe. Gold silver ratio, I'm looking at my screen of 73 times, that is not pricing it as money, but it does respond. Um, with gold um, as if it was a junior form of money. So, uh, you know, it hasn't gone totally. Um, what is so interesting, I find, is the complete lack of interest in Western capital markets about silver and gold, while at the same time, there is enormous demand, obviously building up in Asia and particularly China. Silver has, um, uh, if you like, an additional factor driving it. One is that um, uh, India is now expanding its economy quite rapidly in the direction of uh, photovoltaic cells and uh, similar, if you like, environmental um, uh, uh, manufacturing activities. Uh, so, um, and I, I'm sure that um, you know, major Indian corporations like Reliance Industries have been cleaning out COMEX uh, vaults. I mean, the, the amount of silver that's been stood for delivery is really quite dramatic, uh, particularly when you bear in mind that the futures market is not meant to be a delivery market at all. I mean, the only reason that you have a delivery facility is basically to notionally tie the future to the price on expiry. So, um, uh, absolutely. And you can, you know, there's these kind of these there's ideas that are some people say are opposed to each other. Somehow they're mutually exclusive, but they're not. The bullion banks 
can manage and manipulate the price of the precious metals to certain price targets almost on a daily basis. But that doesn't mean price can't go up. I mean, it, that evidence is right staring you in the face, right? Gold's gone from $400 to $2,400 in the last 20 years. But the bullion banks, you know, there's still a JP Morgan Global Precious Metals Desk, right? There's still a uh, Citigroup. There's still, you know, uh, UBS, you know, Goldman Sachs, go down the list. So there's money to be made. What they can't have is a 50% year. You know, that'd be catastrophic. I think the best year we've seen, you know, while we've gone from 400 to 2400 is about 25%, 28% back in 2011. Okay. Uh, they can manage 10%, 30%, 50% is a whole other deal. And that gets back to what you mentioned earlier, getting in about uh, the heads, four heads of different uh, bullion banks, these trading desks, you know, JP Morgan and HSBC. And I can't remember what the other two were, all ran over to Shanghai back in, from a period of late March into early April. I mean, there's Reuters stories on all four of them. Some of them use the same picture. <laughs> and you know that they're just caught in a jam now. In silver, in that, um, you know, we we get reported through the CFTC their gross positions, and you know, and you can compute the net positions every week with the commitment of traders' reports. We know from that data, as a group, how much net short they are. Uh, not even including the producers that are allegedly hedging or selling forward. Just the what are called the the banks, the swap dealing banks. Uh, they're currently net short about 40,000 contracts. What 5,000 ounces of contract, that's $200 million. And you're like, well, wait a second. Every dollar that the price goes up, then that's $200 million in losses. So you think, okay, well, they've got an incentive to keep price in check. But the problem if they keep price, their price, the New York price in check, and the Shanghai price keeps going like this, um, well, now that ar an arbitrage opportunity develops, and all of a sudden the silver that is backing the exchanges, you know, and all their derivatives and the leverage in there, all of a sudden they risk losing. India imports more silver in four months than in all of 2023. India's silver imports in the first four months of the year have already surpassed the total for all of 2023 on rising demand from the solar panel industry and as investors bet on an outperformance versus gold, government and industry officials told Reuters. Increased imports by the world's biggest silver consumer could support global prices, which are trading near their highest level in more than a a decade. India imported a record metric tons of silver during January to April, up from 455 tons in the same period a year ago, said a government official who declined to be named as he was not authorized to talk to the media. India imported a total of tons of silver last year. Almost half of this year's imports have come from the United Arab Emirates to take advantage of lower import duty, said an importer based at Ahmedabad in Gujarat. India generally imposes a 15% import duty on silver. However, the Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement signed between India and the UAE in 2022 allows private traders to import silver through the India International Bullion Exchange paying 9% duty and an extra 3% in value added tax. Now we'll show you more excerpts of the interview. Remember to watch the video to the end so you don't miss out any insights. Let's get back into the episode. So lately, there's been a lot of talk about the global inventories disappearing in silver. I mean, you look at Comex, uh, it, it's you know been bled dry for years. We've talked about that. You look at the LBMA, it's got the lowest level of inventory, second lowest inventory level of inventory for sure in the last hundred, in the 140 year history of, of the exchange. And now we're beginning to see things on Shanghai disappear. We've seen, and we'll talk about that, we've seen the ETFs be bled dry Everyone says, well, there's, you know, there's great availability in the retail market. Well, that'll change. It'll change really fast if what I'm seeing is actually happening. Uh, the, the American public has been asleep at the switch. They have been in, infatuated with NVIDIA and Bitcoin. They've even been infatuated with the 5% return in, in treasuries with no risk. I understand all of this. 
but they're missing what could be a generational move in metals and in particular in silver. Now, there was a lot of talk, and Mr. Jensen talked about the all of a sudden you have bullion bankers showing up at the Shanghai Metals Exchange. Now, remember, um, the the numbers on on um, the LBMA, we're told there's 800 million ounces of silver there, of which 500 million belong to the ETFs. And when you realize this, th that leaves 300 million ounces, that's about what is left on COMEX in the entire ecosystem uh, in COMEX, about the same amount. But uh, in COMEX, there's only about 40 million ounces backing the contracts. The rest of it is eligible and it's not for sale. So who knows what the real numbers are, but they are, you know, 300 million ish or less globally on the Western system and probably a lot less backing everything. I'll keep that in mind. But I did some digging myself and I went right on to the Shanghai Metals Exchange website. And you can see for four straight weeks starting uh, the second week in March, first we had Deutsche Bank, then we had HSBC Bank, then we had JP Morgan, and then Standard Charter Bank show up one after another for four straight weeks. And Jamie Dimon evidently is there right now. And this is Hemke's take on the subject. Some of that. So it's like, okay, we can either keep the price low to keep our paper short position from, you know, accumulating a couple billion dollars in losses, or we could risk kind of an existential event and have our vaults get drained. And so they're, that's what I mean, kind of rock and a hard place. Now, one last thing though on that. To you and me, it sounds simple, right? It's like, hey, look, I uh, Shanghai last night I was trading $36 an ounce. And in the U.S., it's 32. So an ar simple arbitrage is you buy in the U.S. and you sell in Shanghai. U.S. price goes up from the buying. The Shanghai price goes, goes down from the selling. And, you know, and you close that gap. Well, it's $4 enough to make that profitable. Is it is $4 enough to take the risk? And that's something that when I hear people or read people talking about this potential arbitrage, I think gets left out because to execute that trade and to close that gap, you again, you have to buy in the West and sell in Shanghai. Okay, well, if you're buying in the West for a future delivery in Shanghai, you better be darn sure you can actually get your hands on that metal, much less ship it over there and do everything else, you know, and uh, that you know, customs and everything else you got to do to get it, the metal into China itself. Because otherwise, you know, the other end of this thing is short. So do you want to be, you know, if you, if, if the COMEX or a bank in, in New York says, ah, eh, we'll get you this in 90 days. Do you want to be left hanging out here short in Shanghai? Right. It's like getting sideways with some of the guys, you know, walking down the street in Newark. I'm thinking about, you know, like a, a Sopranos episode or something here. I don't want to get sideways with Shanghai at all on this deal. So there's a risk to putting on that ARB just because I don't, I don't think anybody could ever feel comfortable in size, you know, a couple thousand contracts worth, you know, 10 million ounces or something in size enough to make that that ARB worthwhile and so it just continues to widen and widen and keep going this way again it's a very interesting situation we're in and not one that many of us really anticipated as the year began and mcleod shares some closing remarks on the whole situation now with a focus on china's position for gold and silver that is interesting but i think um for both gold and silver um it's worth understanding the position of the chinese uh, just look at Chinese households. Um, Chinese ho households uh, save roughly 35% of their income. That is huge. It is enormous. And given the size of the economy, which in um, US dollar terms is roughly $18.3 trillion in GDP, 35% of that is about $6 trillion. Now, $6 trillion of savings, where does it go? Well, um, if you look at property, that's yesterday's story. After Ever Evergrande went bust and all the rest of it, all those pro problems. And you can see that um, the amount of land um, now being developed, it's just fallen off a cliff. There is no demand for property in, in China now, you know, residential property. 
So that's gone out of the window. Um, stock market, well, for the last three years, it's been a pretty poor deal. It's gone down. It's gone up this year, really, since about January the 1st. It's up about 8 9%, something like that. But, um, yeah, you know, if you're an investor, if you're a saver in China, you're probably, you've probably got in your mind um, the fact that you've lost a lot of money or you would have lost them a lot of money if you'd bought equities um, over the last three years. So it's not going there either. We do know where it's going. It's actually going on bank deposit. And there is a difference between our banks and Chinese banks. The Chinese banks are effectively backed directly by the state. So, um, you know, a, a, a Chinese individual feels really quite comfortable um, having a three year what they call certificates of deposit, um, giving them an income of three um, percent over, over three years, you know, what three percent annual annually over three years. So that is where they put it. Now, this is effectively risk averse stashing of savings. Um, all these banks. Uh, coincidentally offer um, gold savings accounts. So if you've got a minimum of, say, five or six hundred yuan, which is roughly $80, um, then you can open one of these accounts. Now, I don't know whether the um, uh, these big banks uh, run their um, the gold accounts on a fractional reserve basis or whether they um, actually back it properly. But what do you think of the three experts take? Is the East making huge profits with the COMEX arbitrage? Will supply constraints make silver go to 50? We want to know your opinion. So post a comment down below and watch this video right here because it's a perfect fit for you. I see you on the other side.